Good evening, folks, and thanks for joining us tonight. Um, my name is Alana Zenos, and I'm the Executive Director of the National Buffalo Museum. The museum's mission is to advocate for the restoration of the North American bison through education and outreach. Uh, a solo art show is a new but exciting way for us to do just that. So we're really glad you're here for the virtual, op virtual opening reception of I Am Bison and the conversation with the show's creator, Patty Swigert. Um, we hope you have your favorite beverage and snack nearby while you enjoy some artwork. First, I'd like to introduce the museum, the museum staff. Um, they're gonna be moderating tonight. Rachel Johnson is the museum's curator of collections and she's going to be interviewing Patty. And Megan Hennis is the museum's visitor services and membership coordinator and she'll be monitoring the chat and the Q&A this evening. So just over to you, Megan. Thank you. All right, let's go. So before I turn things over to Rachel to get us started, I invite you to let us know where you're um, watching from. So thanks again for joining us for tonight's reception and artist talk. And now I'm going to turn things over to Rachel. Great. Thanks, Alana and Megan. Once again, I want to welcome everyone to our first virtual opening and artist talk. There's a lot of ways that COVID-19 has been really disruptive to all of our lives, of course, and it's really unfortunate that we can't have you all here in the gallery tonight, but we really um, are appreciative of the silver lining of the pandemic that allows us to share things with the whole world, just with an audience that we might not have been able to reach without um, the, the impetus of a pandemic. So um, we don't take that opportunity for granted and glad you're all here tonight. I'm glad, guessing that we have some folks with us here who are interested in art in general and Patty's art in particular, but might not have as much familiarity with the subject of bison. Uh, I myself have been lucky enough to always live within proximity of bison and bison herds. Um, and when I was a child, we would drive past the herd that, lived, that was closest to us and we would look to see if they were out and it was always, exciting if we could see them from the road. So I always knew the bison were special, but I also knew they were around. Um, as I have started working here at the museum though, I've realized that a lot of folks believe bison to be extinct. It's a very commonly Googled question. I've discovered when did bison go extinct? And they didn't. So I wanna just really quickly give you all a history of bison um, so that we can have that background when we start talking about this exhibit. Before the arrival of Europeans to North America, there were around 30 million bison. Now that number is debated. You will probably see other numbers out there, higher and lower, but that's the number we use um, kind of in the middle of some of the estimates. But then through displacement and decimation of native people, introduction of new diseases from European livestock and direct hunting of bison for sport and also to feed military personnel and railroad workers, by the late 1800s, there were fewer than 1,000 animals left. And you can see on the graph currently on your screen, the drop off in numbers was sharp in a really short amount of time from 30 million to less than 1,000. Uh, bison were one of the many victims of the philosophy of manifest destiny, but there were people who worked really hard to preserve animals which were left. And through their hard work, there are now around 400,000 bison in North America today. And only a fraction of those animals are in public herds, such as national and state parks and wildlife preserves and nature preserves. There are also um, a fraction of bison in tribally owned herds, but the majority of animals live on private ranches where they're raised for meat production. And in fact, believe it or not, if it hadn't been for the economic value of bison meat, this restoration story wouldn't have been possible. Um, the public lands just don't have the carrying capacity to support large numbers of, of animals. So ranches have been key to the restoration success story. And one of the ways you can be part of that success story is to purchase bison meat from stores and restaurants and directly from bison meat producers. We have a 17 minute film that's available on our website and our YouTube channel that chronicles this story. So. If you're interested, go find that after our talk and get a little more information. We also did a series this spring called Bison After Breakfast, where we explore some of the issues related to bison ranching um, in detail. Bison and the prairie environment evolved with each other 
uh, bison are what is known as a keystone species, which means that their presence is key to the whole ecosystem. Unlike cattle, bison are really good for the land. The way they move and graze supports the health of plants, which in turn supports um, all the other animals that live in the ecosystem and um, keeps the ecosystem healthy. So bison ranchers understand this and by raising bison for commercial market, they're also supporting biodiversity and the overall land health. So back to our exhibit, I Am Bison. This show was born out of the juried art show that we hosted in the summer of 2019. And Patty was one of the participants in that show. And the entry in that show inspired her to propose a solo show telling the bison story. Uh, we've been thrilled to work with her through this past year to weave, and I say weave sometimes figuratively and sometimes literally, the messages about bison restoration into the museum space. So the three galleries that this show occupies have really come alive with her unique work, and you'll get to see that here in a bit. So to introduce Patty, she's originally from South Carolina. She grew up in Bethesda and Chevy Chase, Maryland. She returned to South Carolina to graduate from Coker College after spending a year studying art history and languages in Switzerland and Florence, Italy. She later got her MBA at Harvard and pursued a career in financial management, specializing in turnarounds of small and medium-sized businesses. She's lived in Virginia for 32 years where she has a 97 acre farm. Patty's first love is horses and she has 10 horses of her own and also boards horses for others. She teaches writing to area children along with lessons in history, art and science, all in relationship to horses. Patty's work has been shown in venues in Virginia and around the country, as well as in Korea and Ukraine. Her works range in size from micro sculptures to room size installations. And in fact, we have pieces on both of those extremes in the I Am Bison show. She works in various media, including concrete, LED lights, paper, fabric, fiber, metal, wood, stone, glass, and repurposed and found objects. Often experiential and interactive, tactile and touchable, some of her pieces capture light, texture, and color, while others address controversial social issues. I see native humans and animals as they navigate a changing world. I have the pleasure now of introducing you to Patty Swigert, the creator of I Am Bison. Welcome, Patty. So glad you're here tonight. Thank you very much. It's been a pleasure to work on, on these uh, pieces of art for a whole year, which it really did start way back in, I guess, August when we had our conversation. And um, I had these ideas for the show. And I think mostly the inspiration was that I just couldn't believe the graph that you just showed. I really couldn't believe in less than 300 years, it went from millions of bison to less than a thousand. So I think that that was what really shocked me the most and inspired me with most of the works that I did.
this is such a great body of work and we've really enjoyed watching it come to life and now getting to see it in person here in the museum. Tonight we've selected four pieces that we're going to talk about in detail and we're starting with Hoof, which is also behind me. Um, and just so nobody is surprised when it happens, I will be at points shutting off my camera and moving around the gallery to other areas. So just bear with me when that happens. So we're gonna start with talking about Hoof. This piece definitely stands out as being really distinct from other pieces in the show. And I think of this piece as a graph very much like the one we looked at earlier, but more, much more visually interesting. Can you tell us about how this piece developed? So I often work with shadows um, and I had this idea that I could cast faint shadows of the bison hooves onto an adjacent or the, the wall behind the piece. So I had to figure out how to get paint or stitching to be opaque enough that the shadow would come through a sheer fabric and not come through the hood. So I, um, I happened to find this beautiful piece of linen. It was at a local charity shop and it was on a roll and I was like, yes, that'll be mine. And I knew exactly what I would do with it. And so I began, I'd done a small sample and I began painting the hood and it kind of evolved. The colors are all mixed. They're, um, the base of them is a gold or a copper, and they are all um, mixed in different colors and hand um, painted on. And then as you see, as I, and they represent each, you know, each band represents years and centuries of when the bison were on, on this continent. And as I got down to right at the bottom where you can see there's a, a few red dots that are French knots out of stitching, that is where the elimination of the species almost happened. So those little dots represent the fact that there weren't any more hoof um, prints on the land and that it was almost going to be no bison, except for in a few museums or circuses or a few places where they had been protected. And then I transferred from painting to stitching. So those last four hooks are uh, stitched on and they represent um, the efforts of the people that saw the need to protect this species and who started to rebuild the herds. And so the hand stitching of that represents how how I saw the herds coming back to life again. And uh, it, it, the size of it was really dictated by the fabric. Um, the salvage, it was salvage to salvage. So that was what I went with. And um, it was a pretty time consuming piece to make because I was actually mixing each color and putting it on. And sometimes it wasn't thick enough because of the opacity I wanted. So I had to double it up. And you can see in certain places, if you can see a close up, um, you'll see sometimes a double layer of two colors where I um, I overlaid them to get the opacity. It's hard to see on this photograph, but there's another one, I think that is this one on the angle where you could actually see the little um, hooves um, in the shadow. Yeah, and unfortunately, none of our photos really capture that as well as they, as they could, but the, the light does cast the hoof shadows on the wall and it, it is really neat. A, a lot of your work, um, seems to involve shadows as, as you spoke about right. that inspiring you to start this piece. Um, and I know like we, we messed with the lighting quite a bit until we we're like, okay, I think that, I think we see the hooves now. And I'm just really sorry exactly. we can't capture the photos. Everybody can see it and you can see it with, with your eyes in real life. Okay, I'm gonna turn my camera off and um, move over so that folks can see coronation behind me and I'll have Megan change the slide. So I, I paid yep. a visit to uh, a bison farm, um, Chaboa farm, which is up in Culpeper, about an hour and a few minutes away from my farm. And I was able to, the, the owners weren't there, but I was able to scarf up some bones out of the, um, the, the pig pen that you have to walk through in order to get to the bison. And, uh, but they weren't really very beautiful, but they were pretty chewed down and nicely um, dried out because the pigs had been chewing on them. And then I called them up and I said, hey, guys, can you find me some more bones? So kindly, one of the women who works there went into their compost pile and found all kinds of bones for me. 
and drove them down to my house because this was during the pandemic, the early part of the pandemic. So she drove them to my house. Great, because she said it was just too impossible to mail them because it was just such a big box. And, um, and I kind of knew that six of these jaw bones would become this piece, but I had no idea how it was all gonna come together. So the first thing I had to do is, of course, I had to sanitize these bones. So that was a, a trip in and of itself. Um, the Bison Farm recommended Polydent. If it works for people's teeth, I guess it's gonna work for the, the, the teeth of the bison. So I soaked them in that, it got soaked in hydrogen peroxide and then they were all left outside for um, months in the sun to sun bleach. And the idea behind this was that there were just so many piles and piles of bones from the slaughtered bison all over the West. And there's a famous photograph of a man standing on top of really a mountain of bison bones. And it was really heartbreaking to see this. And so I wanted to create something that honored these bones that were left um, by these slaughtered animals. And so this is what I came up with. Um, getting it to all hold together was really not a very easy process, but I, I, I persevered. It was all done outside in a box. And um, it's kind of hard to see, but there's thread that goes through it. But then I've wrapped another yarn and thread around that. So um, each, and then some of it goes behind and some of it goes in front of the bison. And I know that the museum was very hesitant when they went to unpack this because it looks like it had shifted in the packing in the transfer or the shipping, but it really, it just kind of falls into its own place. And, um, and I have done a lot of vessels through my art, um, many of them quite large. And I knew this could be an, a non-functional vessel. So something that you can't put anything into. You can just put your honor of the bison there. And that's kind of where it holds its space. And again, shadows are really important in this piece. You can see some faint shadows on the back where they've lit it. And um, sometimes that's even more significant than the actual piece itself. Yeah, in fact, I think we've got on the next slide yeah, a neat uh, capture of the shadow. Now. Um, do I remember that this vessel changed its name as you were working on it? It did, and I don't even remember the first name. I think it was, it went through actually quite a few different names. And then finally I realized coronation, which is the honoring the crown. And it kind of looks like a crown chandelier piece. So that's what it became. And it was not an easy one to pack for that's chicken. Great. Okay. <laughs> that was a That was a tricky right. one to get there. And yeah, and Patty's right. We we called her in a in a half panic, thinking it had been damaged. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and and change locations now. We're going to talk about Wheel of Life, and one of the reasons this is special to me, the piece that we're going to look at next, is that I had a very small role in its creation by collecting soil from my home states of Colorado and New Mexico last year when I was home during the holidays. So there's a lot to talk about in this piece. Not only all the techniques you use to create it, but all the symbolism in it. So uh, if Megan will bring that slide up, then I'll move my camera and uh, we'll talk about Wheel of Life. Okay, so this piece, I've had this blanket that is a beautiful old brown wool blanket that the moths have eaten and who knows what else ate along over the, I probably had it 40 years. And I, it used to have a mate and the mate it doesn't exist anymore. I don't know where it is, but anyway, I just, never found the right piece to take advantage of this old wool. And I love working with wool. It's very soft to stitch. It's, it has this texture. And so um, I started with this and I started with the wheel and um, Rachel kindly had um, gotten some soil from different locations out West where she had uh, spent time Colorado and Santa Fe and places like that. And so she had sent me little baggies of that. And I had some Virginia soil where bison were also in Virginia. And then I had some earth pigments that I had bought years ago. And this blue of the, the one over here is with that. And so I'm, I used those 
the soil, I mix it with a slight uh, amount of glue and a uh, very small amount and some water. And then I was able to paint it on to this wall. And uh, then I was able to add my stitching. And these were all found um, yarns and things that I've come upon and had them for a long time. And I realized that this wheel not only represents a wheel of life and the different species, the different bison that are no longer with us and the ones that are with us. So they were they're the extant and the extinct um, bison, but it also represented the wagon wheels of progress of the settlers moving west and even moving in through Virginia and, and Kentucky and places like that, where basically within a matter of years, the bison were just decimated. Um, bison would come to the, in the East Coast, would come to the uh, salt licks and they had a routine, obviously needing that for their survival. They'd come through the salt licks. So they had a pattern. It was pretty easy to kill them because you just sit at the salt lick and as they came along, so it didn't take very long before um, East of the Mississippi, they were pretty much wiped out. So the wheel was to bring the bison back to be able to see the different forms that they, some were larger, some were smaller, some long, hugely long horns, some had more horns like the ones today. And so that's how it came about. And I'm so glad this old blanket found a home. <laughs> I still have some more pieces of this blanket, so it will it will probably find another, another home as well in some sort of art. Oh, and by the way, I didn't like, I didn't like the color, uh, ex the exact color of the blanket. It, it was not quite right. So I had um, collected some walnuts, black walnuts, actually a year before, and they were sitting on my shelf. And so I made walnut ink, which worked like a dye. And I boiled it and, um, and then dipped this, this wool into it. And I also felted the wool by heating it up and putting it in a hot washing machine and, and um, trying to give it some more structure. But anyway, so that's, I was able to change the color of that as well with the walnut ink, which is right from, you know, trees not too far from where I live. Yeah, that's, so folks can see it here behind me. The lighting is not ideal again, using the laptop camera, but um, hopefully these close-ups give you a better idea of all the color and detail that, that show up here. So you, you talked about the decimation of the bison and being represented in this piece, and that's gonna be, the main theme of the piece we look at next, which is by some point of view. Uh, it's a room size installation. We spoke about it earlier and it was in the video. Um, and our photos don't do it justice either. But uh, again, I invite everybody to come see us and see it in real life. If I'm remembering correctly, this was one of the first pieces that developed, uh, one of the first concepts that, that came to you. Can you tell us about how that developed? And then I'll move over to the piece itself. So. When I, when I was giving you information about a possible solo show, um, I had been working with something called pan pastels. They're a pastel, but they're in a little container and um, they're very dense and, and they're not used on fabric. I don't know, maybe one or two other people in the world use it on fabric, but most people don't. And so I was able to do a piece for another show that's traveling around the country right now, a small piece by taking the little, almost like a palette knife with a sponge on it and, and doing them and it came out really good. So I did a small sample for the museum so they would have an idea. So this piece was in my, in my thought forms very early on. I originally envisioned it probably having eight or 10 panels. It now has six. I thought that it would have text on it. Um, I soon eliminated the idea of, a te of text on it and I realized that I needed to kind of communicate what happened to the bison from their point of view. So without words, just in pictures. Um, so the the first panel on the far on the far left is the millions of bison. So it's a complete herd. It's like four bison that are all clustered together on a little hillside, and um, it's done with this pastel on this sheer fabric, which is again repurposed fabric. Um, a friend was selling her farm and had this, so I, I got rolls of it, so I used it for that. And then this, the next panel, coming to the towards the right, is missing one bison. And then the next panel is missing another bison, and the next one is missing another one. 
And as it goes through this, the bison are actually cut out of the fabric. So there's a complete gap. There's nothing in the fabric and it's very, very lightweight fabric. So it's very airy. And I see it on this second photo here where there's just nothing there and there's threads that hold the whole thing together. So I just sewed threads so that it just dangles. And in this one, I think you can probably see, I think it's probably three panels you can see, or at least two at one time. And then, and you can see this one is where every bison is gone except for this one, the one on the right, um, I mean the left. And then the next panel was an interesting one. It, it didn't really want to come together and it was really almost an accident <laughs> in that I used a, um, a glue basically to outline them. And then I threw it in the dye bath that I created and it came out like this and I went, okay, that's it. <laughs> I don't have to do anything more to it. And then the next one, which is behind that one is where the herds are then being rebuilt. And it's the one solo bison again, who's leading the path so that we will rebuild the herds in this country. So panel six and being able to hang them in, in one in front of the other means you can kind of see through them. And I love that the way that the, the, the horns came through on this one and you can see it from front to back or back to front or side to side. It doesn't really matter um, which way you look at it. But anyway, that's, that's how it, it came about. And I think it, it, developed better by having it not have words attached to it and just having the images come and go and the museum did a great job because it's not easy at all to it's number one not easy for me to be doing this from from virginia it's not easy for them to be doing it in north dakota trying to figure out what i really had in mind and um so we had to you know they were really wonderful about trying to figure out how we would do this and it worked out great I love that this doesn't have words because, I mean, we're a museum and we love our words here. Um, we're all very attached to our words. So I think it's a really great juxtaposition through this whole show, but this piece in particular to, to tell the same story. And of course we have labels on the pieces. There are, it's not that there aren't words, but to have it be so visual, so tactile, so many textures and so much beyond our words is, is really a great way to communicate this story. So those are the four pieces that we are planning to focus on. Um, at this point, we're at questions. So uh, Megan, do you have some for us? Patty touched on it a tiny bit. Um, Jane Fellows is wondering if you've seen the show in person, Patty. I have not seen the show in person. Um, one of my friends encouraged me, you're flying out there, right? But, you know, with COVID, the last thing I need to do is be stranded in some city that gets shut down and now I'm stranded somewhere out in North Dakota and my horses are all here. So that was, I knew that wasn't going to work out very well. So it was, um, thank goodness for Zoom and other, other ways of kind of walking around the show and seeing it and making changes. Cause we did make last minute changes of how things were hung and displayed. That's right. We certainly have been in very frequent communication to make this happen and have it follow your, your vision. Um, I've got a question that's about your sculptures. We just talked about coronation, of course, saw the rest of them in the video, but you use some really unusual materials in your sculpture work. And I wonder if you could talk about your process for selecting those and um, how they become part of your three-dimensional work and speaking more generally. So it, it's kind of interesting in that the entire show does not have one piece of machine stitching in it. Everything that I did for this show so far, there's a couple of pieces I have here that, that never got sent. But every single piece, whether I was hemming the edges or sewing on a way for you to hang it, everything was done by hand. And it's not normally what I would do for such a large piece and so many pieces, but um, somehow or another, that was what I felt needed to, to be the message for this show, is that it's not done by machine, it's done in the way that would have been done by the early inhabitants of North America and the people that would have related to the bison, they would not have had a sewing machine. Um, so that was one thing that, that basically kind of 
surrounded the show for me. And once I started doing it by hand, I realized that that's where it had to go. So that was number one. Um, often it's an idea that gets in my head and I see it and I have no idea what it's going to be made from. And then I find um, sometimes serendipitously a piece of fabric or um, I have a mistake that I make when I'm doing something and it's too dark or it's too light. And I realize that it's perfect for this other vision that I have. So um, the materials really also um, drive it, but I have usually the, I kind of see what I want to create and I'm willing to change it as it goes along because sometimes the materials just simply don't cooperate. They, they literally go, uh, we're not going this direction. <laughs> we don't we don't do that and and so um a lot of times with these pieces they um some of them went together really really quickly and others they just got kind of sidelined and sat there and i looked at them and i was conflicted over them how i would put it together and um every house guest i have which are very few these days because of COVID, and um and then my writing students as well i drag them i drag the stuff out and throw it on the picnic table it's like what do you think guys and um, and I collect a lot of opinions. Um, it's fairly hard to do a big show like this and not have other people's input as you're making it. So that was a challenge for me, working more out of my home. And I have to say some of the pieces like Wheel of Life and um, the Bison Head to Head, the pieces that were done in wool were, were originally rejected and not gonna be part of the show. And I found that by dyeing them or adding the, the soil or the stitching, doing something to them, they, they started to come to life. And, and they, I felt good about having them in this type of a show. So I think it's the materials drove me. My ideas were pretty much already there. And uh, coincidentally, I had, um, because of COVID, um, there's a group that I that I was a member. I used to read their blog, and they brought in guest textile artists to give these weekly challenges. And they expected you to be doing it on something that was like three inches or four inches, really small. And um, and that's what 99% of the people that posted photographs. But I looked at it and I said, Wow, what if I take that and and use that into convert it into bison and see what it comes out as see if i can take a technique and instead of going you know three inches maybe i'm going 30 inches or maybe even bigger so um a lot of the ideas in this show kind of came from techniques that i perfected somewhere else and some of them came with things that i'd never done before that i just simply started doing just because it seemed like the reasonable thing to do so our next question is from Amanda, and she's wondering if um, in the Wheel of Life piece, if the colors are um, represent certain things. I don't think so. <laughs> I didn't have that in mind when I did it. Um, and I was just kind of playing around with different stitches and different yarns. And occasionally, I mean, I had this huge, huge bag of beautiful wool tapestry yarns that I had gotten at again a uh, thrift store and um, I just started playing with them and sometimes I didn't like it and I took it out and other most of the time I liked it and I just kept going so no it was never really a, a, a color other than using the the soils and the earth pigment and then again the walnut ink which kind of muted everything and got it the way I wanted it to be. Thank you. Um, Wendy in Cape Cod is wondering um, which piece gives us the most hope for the future of the herd of bison? Oh, really interesting question. Um, I would say it's the bison point of view because it shows what happened and, and then the herd being rebuilt. And that last panel with that one solo bison and and that one the fabric is still intact the whole panel so there's no nothing cut out of it it just is it can be continued to be added to it isn't a finished piece so i think that's the one that would give the most hope and oh we have more um so bruce 
or Becky, they are, um, they are wondering where bison are in Virginia near you. Oh, uh, where the bison are? Yes. Well, we used to have a bison farm called Georgetown Farm right here in Charlottesville about, oh, like 12 minutes from my house. And they had the huge fences and beautiful land and the bison were there and we saw them all the time and they sold their bison meat in town. And for some reason, maybe about 10 or 15 years ago, I'm not sure, um, it just kind of closed down and the land was sold off, not as a subdivision, but to more smaller farms. So instead of having it like 500 acres, maybe it went into 75 and 100 acres parcels. And so when I wanted to, to get involved with bison in Virginia, I was like, oh, rats, that farm was here. I knew the farm. It was here when I moved here. And so then I had to go on the internet. And I, the only one I found close to me was this Chibula, fa Chibula farm in uh, Culpeper. And um, I was lucky because they said that um, in general, in the summertime, that you, you have only something like a 20% chance of seeing the bison on their farm. There's a walking tour that you can take through it. And in the winter, they said you have much higher higher um, chance of seeing them because they feed them hay. Well, fortunately I got there right before they were feeding them hay. And so they were all just hanging out on the hillside and um, really close. Some of them were more than just a few feet from me when I was taking pictures of them. So that was a great opportunity. And I recommend a lot of people go to that farm. They sell their meat, they have other things and the walking tours are great. Um, they have other animals. They have their, they have the great white Pyrenees that are guarding some of their other cattle. They have pigs, um, a variety of other animals. So it's, it's, it's very family friendly and, um, and the herds look in great shape. So I think the most amazing thing to me when I went there was really, I'm used to big horses. I have right now small horses, but I grew up with really big 17 hand, 1800 pound horses. And when I saw the breeding herd of the cows, I was like, wow, you guys are really small. <laughs> so most people I think have a different reaction to the size of the bison. But for me, they were they they were terribly small because <laughs> they really the girls are just really not more than pony height, large pony height. So that was a little surprising. But that's I think there's other farm um this is one over by Williamsburg and a few other places in Virginia, but I was just lucky and they were very kind and cooperative at the farm in terms of getting me some things. I still have a bison skull on the front porch that they that was damaged and they sent along with the bone. So and I bought some hide from them as well, which is um, in the Cado. I I had the hide and I didn't really know what I would use it for. And sometimes I collect things just hoping they will kind of come together. Yes, this piece right on top. So this is uh, the bison hide that I was able to purchase from um, that farm in Virginia. And that's a tooth that came out of one of the jaws. It's another tooth or series of teeth came, that came out of the jaws. The so one on top uh, with the bison hide around it is, um, it was a piece of bark that I had in my backyard that again, I picked up, it was interesting. And um, that it became that again, the materials spoke to me how they would be put together really i don't sometimes i don't have a vision for it before it kind of comes together in my hands yeah well i'm glad it did speak to you those were fun last minute additions the the caddos exactly so rachel had no idea that i was actually sending them they were just like i don't think i even showed you pictures before maybe i did a day before but i just packed them up and sent them so uh, it looks like we probably um answered the questions we've received Oh, okay. Megan says we've got some more. Yeah, we have one more, um, again, from Amanda. She, this one is about um, the techniques used on hoof. She's okay. wondering if each individual hoof is painted by itself or if you did use some printing techniques. Uh, I actually painted each one by my, you know, by hand. Um, that would not be normally what I would do. I would have made a, um, a some sort of a stamp to do it but that wasn't gonna put the ink on, the paint on thick enough for the, what I wanted to accomplish. So they were, each one of those little hoof groups was hand painted. That sat on my floor for a long time because I have to, there's no place big enough for me to paint. 
there's no table I have big enough. So it's all done on the floor. So I go down and I have to paint maybe two or three rows and because it's wet, you have to leave it. And then, then I can move it and then paint another three rows. But I could only paint a little bit at a time and each one was painted by, by my hand with a brush. So and much detail in that. Fortunately, no help from the dog walking over it. Yeah, she's pretty good about staying out of the living room. She knows she gets yelled at if I've got a piece on the floor. Um, and so it basically, it's kind of interesting because I have the paper that was underneath hooks as I painted it. And some of that paint obviously went right through that sheer linen. I mean, this the linen is in itself really beautiful fabric. Um, I've never really seen a linen that was that sheer and it's pretty close to a pure white. It's not, it definitely has, does not have a vintage feel to it. I have, again, another small piece of that that'll probably become art somewhere else. <laughs> Who knows? I love the repurpose thing. Looks like we've got one more. Um, let's see. Um, Pam is asking if the teepee forms in the wheel of life were an intentional choice. Forms of the, of the cones the coming brand. out. Right. She's wondering if they were intentional. Yeah, they were definitely intentional. They were definitely intentional. And I didn't really see it as a wheel until it was pretty much done. Um, I just did a circle and started the bison. The cones were, uh, the teepee shapes were intentional as they came to the center. Um, yeah. Thanks, Patty. I'm going to move my computer real quick to do our wrap up. I'm going to get closer to the router. We're about at the end of our time today. Um, and Patty, I just want to thank you so much for spending this time with us tonight. Um, I think we should do it again before the show is, is over. And to our viewers, I really appreciate you joining us and your interest in the show. Just a reminder that all these pieces are for sale and Megan will put the price list and the gallery guide in the chat. If you're interested in any of them, shoot me an email and uh, we'll, we'll talk about it more or I can send you more photos. If you'd like to keep up with us uh, and what we're doing here at the National Buffalo Museum, you can follow us on Facebook and Instagram. And also you could join our email list on, the, on our website, which Megan will also drop into the chat. Uh, we appreciate your support in joining us here tonight. We know we have visitors from all over and we'd like to invite you to consider becoming a member of the National Buffalo Museum. Some memberships include access to museums all over North America. Visit our website, which is linked in the chat to find out more. We'd also like to invite you to shop in our online store, which you can access through our webpage and through the link in the chat. We carry hundreds of bison related products and your purchase supports the operation of the National Buffalo Museum. Thank you all uh, again for joining us and thanks to our staff and our volunteers who helped us prepare and install this show and also publicize it and you know, getting the word out so everybody could show up here tonight. We also want to thank Cibola Farms in Virginia for providing Patty with the bison bones that became her amazing works of art. This event has been recorded, so you can look for it on our website and our Facebook and our YouTube channel next week. And coming soon, we're excited to have an interactive virtual tour of the exhibit, which is in progress right now. So you'll be able to, to walk through at your own pace through the exhibit. So look for that on our website coming soon. So we hope to see you all again, either here at the museum or again online. And, and I just wanna let people know, oh, sorry, that the price list is also on our website if you don't find it in the chat. So thank you so much for all of your support and providing a venue for me to express myself in, in something that is so important to America and to this continent. Well, we feel very lucky to be able to host this debut here. Thanks for bringing it to us. All right, goodbye everybody. Have a great night. Thank you. Good night, everybody. Thanks for coming. <laughs>